Uh, that looks wonderful. So our next speaker is Bard Ermentrout, who's going to tell us about a very simple model covering the same material. Take it away, Bard. Yeah, as you would say, now, as, as Monty Python would say, now for something completely different. Um, okay, so this is um, sort of a summer project I started with a former um, PhD student, Erica Motion. Um, um, and one of James's postdocs, TJ Sego, um, and two undergraduates, Emmeline Rial and Lauren Gowana, and me. So it's a taking a completely different tack. For one thing, um, it's unfunded. It was sort of a summer fling. Um, I, I've done this stuff before with not um, summer. I, I've done immunology modeling and things like that with Erica Motion um, in the past. And we sort of started with our, um, so let me, I get, there we go. All right. So um, I will skip through all this stuff because you guys all know this already. It's a novel coronavirus um, affected 62 million worldwide, um, killed, well, this is a couple months ago, so it's killed a lot more, attacks primarily the respiratory system, but there's lots of other things that it also attacks, huge variability in the severity. Um, now this is wrong too, I should have wiped this out. There is a vaccine available it's just not available to us right now because it's um, slow on the uptake. Um, and it's very easy to catch, even easier to catch now to an, um, due to another mutation. So there's lots of uh, modeling efforts ongoing, a huge number of papers on immunology. Um, this talk is mostly gonna be about viral host dynamics. Um, there's lots and lots of work on um, much more detailed models, um, molecular levels, molecular dynamics models, um, viral dynamics, um, Amber Smith and Alan Pearlson, um, cellular and tissue, tissue level effects. And I believe this, this fader group is the one that, um, that um, Jim just talked about, that, that Professor Macklin just talked about. Um, and there's also the cellular and tissue level effect efforts, which is um, James stuff. I don't think that's connected to this group, right? Is that right? I'm sorry, which, uh, well. I, I was curious. Yeah, Judy and uh, Carson, I think, are separate from. No, no, Day and Carson are separate. I was wondering if um, James's modeling was connected to the stuff we just heard today, because it was sort of agent-based. Uh, we're, we've been talking to each other, uh, but they're complementary modeling efforts. So oh, can, okay. Uh, All right. All right. Sorry. No, no problem. No, oh, Okay. Great. So we're going to do a very simple two-compartment model, starting with um, a simplified version of our previous influenza model. Um, this was published in JTB in 2015. And we're going to include viral reputa um, replication in the upper nasal and lower lung respiratory system, some transfer from the lower to the upper, um, cellular growth and death. Um, there's going to be a small immune subsystem and damage. Um, <clears throat> model is ODE based, only nine variables around 20 parameters. Um, and basically here's sort of a sketch of the model. Um, can you see my arrow or hand or whatever? Yeah. Okay, so we have the upper respiratory tract, the lower respiratory tract. Um, we have healthy cells which are infected by virus and become infected cells, which then release virions. Um, so this is sort of your standard um, viral replication model. Um, in addition, the healthy cells um, die and this is damage. This is sort of the death of them is damage. Um, that damage induces pro-inflammatory um, cytokines, which do also um, collateral damage. I heard that mentioned in the previous talk. Um, these pro-inflammatory things kill the infected cells. They also slow down the viral um, replication. Um, there's a small anti-inflammatory component, which serves to reduce the pro-inflammatory stuff. And this is one compartment in here. And there's not, so there's just, this is shared between the upper and lower um, compartments. 
Okay, so we used um, to calibrate the model with all those parameters. We used some data from Munster et al. in Nature 2020. I think most of you guys probably know about this data. Uh, rhesus monkeys were infected in the nasal cavity and the lungs. Um, virus in the nasal cavity was measured in days 1, 3, 5, 7, 10, 12, 14, and 17. And then lungs in 1, 3, and 5. Uh, we took IL-15 as a proxy for the pro-inflammatory variable F. Um, they had a very detailed clinical symptom scores, and that was a proxy for the damage we used. And Erica, who's really a master at this, um, used MATLAB fit um, to fit the parameters with minimal constraints. Okay, so here's our baseline calibration to just make sure we were on the right track. Okay, there's the upper respiratory tract, the log of the viral units, um, lo lower respiratory tract. Um, in all cases, the monkeys survived. So what we wanna do is we wanna perturb things so that there's um, some monkeys don't survive. Um, here's the um, <clears throat> fit of the inflammation and um, a fit of the damage, okay? So, and then the other things we didn't have data on, but this is what happens. So in the upper part, there's just a little bit of damage. Um, in the lower part, there's more damage. Um, and you can see that we have the standard infected cells go up and then go down. All right, so with the baseline model parameters, we can manipulate different parts of the model. Um, since this is cut to 15 minutes, I'm just gonna talk a little bit about the inflammaging um, manipulations where we change the rate of regeneration of healthy cells and sensitivity to damage. And then what we're gonna do is change parameters so that we kill the patient and we'll see what happens with antiviral and anti-inflammatory things. Okay. So in inflammaging, what we changed here was BHD. That's the regeneration rate of the healthy cells and GFD how sensitive the pro-inflammatory response is to damage. Okay, and these, these are two parameter plots, basically. And what you can see here is a log of the um, growth rate of the, um, of the um, repair of healthy cells. And down here is the sensitivity to the immune response. Okay, or sens sensitivity to damage. All right, um, and in this case, black is high. So up here, upper, low, upper respiratory tract survives, uh, lower respiratory tract survives, virus is wiped out, virus is wiped out. Here's an example of chronic um, infection in the lower part. Um, and of course, this is, um, this is infected cells as well. Okay, here what happens is the virus basically wipes everything out, okay? So here's some examples of time series, um, typical things, lower respiratory tract, when you have inflammation, um, virus is wiped out, but the inflammation comes on and it remains chronic, damage remains chronic. Um, similar things, up, and here's an example where in the upper, this is the upper respiratory tract. You can think of this as chronically, um, chronic damage to the upper respiratory tract, maybe losing your sense of smell or something like that. Um, the infection remains ongoing. So here's a little picture that I like. I, I, I like looking at things geometrically. I kind of learned this idea from my postdoc mentor, um, John Rinzel. Uh, my postdoc mentor almost was Alan Perlson. Um, I just point that out. That was a long time ago. But all right, so here's, I'm going to show you what happens as I change um, AHF, which is, um, let me recall, the AHF is the effect of pro-inflammatory cytokines on healthy cells. So this is sort of collateral damage. All right. And so with normal collateral damage, what we can see is that the inflammation goes up or the inflammation stays steady. The lower health goes down, the inflammation goes up and that stops the virus 
dead in its track, and then we return, okay? If there's too much chronic damage, then what happens is that the, um, we go up here and we get stuck in the chronic state, which you can think of as a chronically inflamed state. And finally, um, if this is really high, if the collateral damage is really high, then basically um, everything dies out. Okay, so those are sort of the three states. Now, once we've managed to induce enough damage that the virus is what's killing you, we can ask what happens um, when we put antiviral therapy in. So what we're gonna do is reduce the ability of the induced immune system to fight the virus. Um, and then we'll apply antiviral therapy in two different locations at the viral replication site and the viral insertion site. And in both cases, timing and strength matter. So here's an example of lower health as a function of time, all right? So here's what happens without, um, when we put on the antiviral really late, all right? Health goes down and then just a slow death until we cross a threshold below which no cells can reproduce and we die out. If we turn things on soon enough, then um, lower health can recover. But if we turn it, if we don't keep it on long enough, then there's still enough residual virus to bring it back down and kill the patient. And similarly, um, however we leave it on long enough, we can wipe out the virus and return to normal health. Um, time applied and strength of antiviral, we get this sort of strength duration curve here. And everything in this region is death. If we don't, uh, um, if we don't make the strength of the antiviral large enough, or if we don't leave it on long enough, um, um, we don't survive. Oh, oh no, this is not leaving it on. It's 10, it's applied for 10 days. This is just the time at which it applies. So we have to get it early enough and strong enough. Okay, last but not least, I wanna say a little bit about anti-inflammatory therapy. By increasing the inflammation induced damage to healthy cells, it's possible to get a chronically inflamed state. There's bistability between health and chronic inflammation in this case, but a great deal of damage is needed to get to the inflamed state. And the strong viral infection can, a strong viral infection can provide that path. So what we explore is timing, duration, and amplitude of anti-inflammatory therapy. Okay, so I'm just gonna skip to this, to the geometry here. Um, since time is running low, well, here's strength. To, uh, I'll just go right to the geometry because I think this is a really kind of cool picture. Um, and because I like phase planes, it's kind of fun um, to see this, okay? So here is lower health along the x-axis and lower viral um, load in the y-axis, all right? And basically, this is a standard, this would be a, a trajectory. The black trajectory would be one where we come on, all the way on, and we become chronic. We stay in a chronically inflamed state. Okay, so that would be too late applying anti-inflammatories and we stay in this chronically inflamed state. Okay, if we put them on too soon, what happens is that the inflammation stops and it doesn't kill the virus. And we can see that the virus is going down, but eventually the virus comes back because there's not enough inflammatory response and we get death by virus. On the other hand, if we put it on at a more reasonable time, then we get returned to full health. Um, and these are just different times at which we turn it on. However, if we put on the anti-inflammatories too late, then boom, we go back to chronic again. Okay, so basically that's summary and conclusions. We found a simple two compartment model of viral replication and simple immune response can explain recent monkey data. Possible outcomes are back to normal, chronic inflammation, the structure of upper or lower respiratory tract is also possible. There's many attractors and the virus creates a path between them. 
mitigation strategies such as antiviral and anti-inflammatory drugs were tested and there's a good deal of dependence on time, strength, and duration. Still a lot of avenues to explore. And finally, the acknowledgements, this Erica Motion is at Carlo um, University in Pittsburgh, TJ Sago is at Indiana, um, Lauren Gowana is a Carlo undergrad, and Emmeline Rial is a University of Pittsburgh undergrad. And I wanna really thank James Glazier for bringing this problem to my attention. He emailed me, I think back in April and um, got me interested. So I'll stop here. Okay, thank you very much, Bart. That was a very brief summary of really interesting work. It's, it, it's very impressive to see that undergraduates can, can have such a, a leading role in this kind of effort. Uh, the work we did also had two undergraduates who got it started, um, and uh, mm -hmm. we appreciate that. So there's time for a question or two for, for Bard. Again, we don't have very much time, but certainly time for at least one good question. Mm -hmm. Alan. Yeah, Bard, I, I'm, like you, I love phase planes, but you have a nine-dimensional model. So how do you reduce it to something that makes sense in two dimensions? Oh, uh, it, 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 it really is a nine dimensional system. And this is just sort of, um, I picked those two variables because I think they're very instructive to what's going on. But yeah, it, 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 the, 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 there are saddle points in here, which unfortunately have eight dimensional um, <laughs> manifold. So we can't really see what's going on geometrically. Um, we have looked at, for example, a reduced immune system version where we don't even put any virus in there. It's just the immune and normal. And then you can reduce that even further by making the sort of pseudo steady state um, approximation. And then you can use the intersection of the null lines. But those approximations of the manifolds are really crappy, um, as, as you might guess, because there are time scales in here. So this is, this is just to illustrate, um, it, it, don't think of it as the, it, it's not a planar system at all. It's mm -hmm. simply just to illustrate these paths and how these things happen. Do you ever find that, uh, you know, if you actually simulate the exact model and compare it to your phase planes that the trajectories sort of disappear from that plane and then show up somewhere else so that the representations not Wait, really say accurate? It again. Say it again. If you actually simulate, you know, the nine-dimensional system, and then compare the trajectories that you get in two dimensions to what you're plotting, do you ever find that the trajectories sort of leave the phase plane and then some show up later because they do no, this, this, this was this was just a projection of the full nine-dimensional. Ah, it's a projection. So it, yeah, so it is the full nine-dimensional system. Okay, and you can simulate it on your phone. <laughs> You can. <laughs> okay. Is there one, maybe one more brief question? One question. Um, uh, what's the main difference between uh, the work you just showed and uh, what Alan showed us about a month and a half ago? Because he was also modeling the upper and lower uh, respiratory system, yet the differential equations there. What's the difference? Your equations are different or I, what? I, 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 I think we probably used similar viral replication models. I don't know what you guys did for the immune system, mm -hmm. um, Alan. So yes, we, we didn't have any inflammation in our system. Okay. So and the only things nope. we've done is we put in things like an interferon response so, and uh, a sort of a cheat on a T cell response. Uh, so there we go. That's that. But there not is, no inflammation. Okay, again, I apologize for cutting the discussion short, but I hope that people will follow up. Uh, Bard and, and Paul's contact information is available. These will be recorded. I put in the chat that, that the prior uh, mini seminars have been recorded and are available, and I encourage people to look at those and, uh, and uh, uh, see what other people did in this, in this short format as well. Thank you, Bart, again, for, for being willing to present. Um, I want to just outline quickly. Uh, next week, we have Grace uh, Peng from uh, Nibib. Of course, she's the person who organized IMAG-MSM uh, and is sort of the patroness of the working group. 
Uh, and so she's going to be talking about NIBIB uh, interests in this area and also potential overlap between this working group and others uh, and collaborative opportunities. So I think people may find that quite interesting. And then we also have a talk by Gwanglin of Purdue University and uh, on uh, deep learning based approaches. So going from uh, these mechanistic approaches to uh, AI assisted work. Uh, for the 21st, uh, we have uh, a talk on kinetic modeling of an RNA pathogen. Uh, and then we have some openings. So please uh, volunteer to speak if you're uh, interested. Uh, we don't have to have people specifically from the working group. So if there are people you'd like to hear speak, uh, please contact us, especially uh, send Bruce an email and uh, we'll do our best to get your favorite speakers on the schedule. 